It was the night of June 11, 323 BCE, in the city of Babylon, when a royal ring clattered upon a palatial floor. The echo of this ring was heard from India of the Vedas to Greece of the Orphic Hymns, and from Sogdia of the Avestas to Egypt of the Pyramid Texts. It signalled the death of Alexander the Great, conqueror of Persia and one of the titans of history. His heartbroken troops wept at the sound of the news, while his friends and companions were left with one question. Who was to rule after the young monarch's death? Alexander's own answer was, to Cratisto, or to the strongest. His wife Barsini held their son Heracles, while his legal wife Roshanek caressed her pregnant belly, both hoping it would be their children who would rule the ancient world. Back in Macedon, Alexander's sisters Kinani, Cleopatra and Thessaloniki hoped to stake their claim to the throne, while in Babylon, his brother Arhidaeus hoped to claim it for himself. But the dying breath of the conqueror would only spell the end of his empire. His generals, or Diadochi, were destined to usher four decades of war, intrigue and carnage upon all those who heard the rings fall. These conflicts would become known as the Wars of the Diadochi. It is these wars that will usher in one of Eurasia's most vibrant epochs, the Hellenistic Age. Welcome to our introductory video of our remaster of the Wars of the Diadochi and the beginning of the Hellenistic Age. This video was sponsored by our kind YouTube members and patrons. Becoming a YouTube member or patron is the best way to support our work, so we're now providing our supporters with exclusive videos to thank them. Join their ranks to watch the Pacific War series, alongside the First Punic War, Sulla's biography, the Italian War of Unification, Risorgimento, the Russo-Japanese War, Albigensian Crusade, History of Prussia, and much more. 80 or so exclusive videos in total. In 2024, YouTube members and patrons will watch series on the Fall of Sparta, the Reconquista, Second Punic War, Spanish War of Succession, and Russian Civil War, and will continue getting early access to all videos, access to an exclusive Discord server, will know our schedule, and vote on future videos. YouTube member and patron support allows us to keep the majority of our videos free in a world where YouTube monetization income is very uneven. If you want to support our work, join their ranks today via the link in the description and pinned comment. Thank you. Before getting into our long story, we must first discuss our primary sources. Like the Persian and Peloponnesian Wars, most of our information on the Diadochi Wars comes from one ancient writer, Diodorus Sikelos. Diodorus Sikelos was from Sicily and lived in the 1st century BCE. His Bibliotheca Historica is a significant work of universal history, from mythic times to the start of the Gallic Wars. There are issues with his work, such as unreliable sourcing, but modern scholars generally consider his work on the Diadochi to be useful. In addition to Diodorus, the Greek philosopher Plutarch wrote some stories relevant to the Diadochi Wars. Other ancient sources, such as the Roman historian Justin, or surviving inscriptions on Babylonian cuneiform tablets, have allowed scholars to construct a rough chronology of the significant events of the Hellenistic era. Another thing to consider is the nature of the Macedonian or Hellenistic monarchies, who acted as the main drivers of these conflicts. Macedonian kingship revolved around delegating duties from the king to his companions, or phili, friends who grew up and fought alongside him. In addition, military values dominated Macedonian life. Thus, when Macedonian kings ended up ruling over lands of incredible wealth, like Persia, People who felt they had a noble right to rule due to Macedonian courtly values ended up clashing with other generals of less noble birth who had invested in fighting with Alexander. The various parts of the empire the Diadochi ended up ruling had their own traditions and social structures, and this impacted how each epigonos acted. Hellenistic kingship emulated Alexander for legitimacy, at least in the early period, and this appeal to continuity is a key issue for the wars. The Diadochi used these militaristic values to assert control in their courts and form government structures on top of the existing local ones. After an initial morning shock, the Diadochi met before an assembly of their soldiers in front of Alexander's empty throne in the Partition of Babylon, called by Perdiccas, the man who now served as temporary regent over Alexander's empire. Perdiccas, the son of a noble Macedonian family from Orestis, had placed the diadem, ring, cuirass and robe on the throne, and said that they had to choose a new leader. This immediately divided the room, 
as the Daidoki all had different ideas as to who that leader should be. One proposal by Niakos, the man who had sailed from India back to Persia, was to crown Heracles, the son of Alexander and Barsini. Another choice was to wait and see if Roshanak's child would be a boy, and let him rule. Ptolemy, who had served alongside Alexander, instead proposed a rule by council. This was partially due to xenophobia, as unlike Alexander's pragmatic and ambitious policy of accommodating Persian and Greek customs into one universal monarchy, most of the Diadochi did not want to be ruled by half-Persian emperors. Ultimately, no consensus could be found, and soon conflict erupted. Meliega, an experienced general who fought against the Gete, said that this entire council was all a master plan by Perdiccas, because no matter which child ruled, he would be its guardian, and thus the de facto king. In typical Greek soap opera fashion, one random soldier in the background shouted that Alexander's half-brother, Arhideos, was already here and could rule. Despite objections being raised that Arhideos had some sort of mental disability that allowed him to function but made him prone to bouts of instability, many soldiers agreed he should rule. Two factions formed, one of mostly generals siding with Perdiccas, and one of mostly soldiers with Arhideos. Meliega, under unclear circumstances, ended up joining the second faction, and gained so much support that Perdiccas was forced to call for help from the Persian Epigoni, the Persian nobles who had sided with Alexander. A stalemate developed, and the next day, Meliega assembled the mutineers to find and arrest Perdiccas. The faction who had all sided with Perdiccas got Eumenes, the elderly general who had served under both Philip and Alexander, and was popular with the common phalanx soldier to try to calm the troops, who did so by agreeing to a co-regency of Arhideos's and Roshnak's child if it was a boy. The next day, a purification ceremony was called, but where the soldiers expected reconciliation, they got revenge. As the two sides embraced, the Persians arrested 300 seditionists. Meliega, who realized that the generals had set up a trap, fled to a temple but ended up surrendering to the Perdican faction and was murdered. This would be the first of many such backstabs. The council that resumed afterwards had the following separation of courtly powers. Arhideus, now Philip III, was now the king of the Macedonian Empire. Perdiccas was regent, Seleucos was companion commander, and Cassander was commander of the guard. Moreover, the massive realm Alexander had conquered was divided among the most influential of the Diadochi. Antipater got Illyria, Macedon, Epiros, and Greece, Lysimachos got Thrace, Leonatos got Hellespontine Phrygia, Antigonos got Greater Phrygia, Lycia, and Pamphylia, Asander got Caria, Eumenes got Paphlagonia and Cappadocia, and Ptolemy was given Egypt. Many local Persians got satrapies as well, such as Atropates, the satrap of Media, who had once fought against but then joined forces with Alexander. Moreover, many rulers in the east, like Oxyates, the father of Roshanak, or Porus, maintained local autonomy and retained control of their people. The agency of various local non-Greek leaders will become important in the ensuing wars and the Hellenistic period in general. Two major players were not in Babylon when all this was unfolding. These were Antipater, the elderly regent in Macedon, and Craterus, who had been dispatched alongside Leonatos to take the veterans who wished to return home to Macedon. It was then that simmering discontent in southern Greece, which was xenophobic towards Macedonians, erupted into outright revolt. Many city-states, especially Athens, did not like the idea of Macedonian pan-Hellenism, and this had increased after the exile's decree of 324 BCE, forcing the Greek city-states to accept all their exiled citizens back and relinquish many of their colonies. In addition to all this, there was even a bill in the Agora to recognize Alexander as a god, which for Hellenes was seen as beyond the pale. After debates in the Agora, Athens declared war and instigated a revolt. A strategos named Leosthenes led the charge against Macedonian imperialism. Many other city-states in mainland Greece joined the revolt, especially those in Aetolia and the northern Peloponnesos. However, the revolt gained less popularity in the Aegean and in Sparta, which did not want to fight under Athenian command. 
Leosthenes secured mercenaries with Athenian money and was elected general of the Greeks. After a short and decisive victory against pro-Macedon forces in Palatea, the Athenian strategos went to the famous site of Thermopylae to face down the Macedonian general Antipater, who had amassed 13,000 infantry and 6,000 cavalry to put down the southern Hellenes' revolt. We do not know much about this battle, but we know that the Thessalian cavalry betrayed the Macedonians and ravaged their cavalry. Seeing this chaos unfold, Antipater abandoned the battlefield and fled to the city of Lamia. Leosthenes approached the city with his troops and set up a siege camp. From there, Leosthenes developed a three-tiered plan to induce Lamia's surrender. First, he took troops and marched on the city to challenge the opponents to a field battle. This failed, so Leosthenes moved on to phase two, launching daily assaults on the city walls. However, the Lamian walls were solid and stable, and the Macedonians had an ample supply of projectiles to lob at the attackers, who were consistently repelled. This infuriated Leosthenes, who decided to use the classic strategy of cutting off all supplies into the city and ruthlessly starving the defenders to death. He also began to dig a deep trench and build a wall to completely seal off the Macedonians from the outside world. In response, Antipater decided to go for a desperate strategy. Using projectiles for cover, he took his troops outside and raided the Athenian siege camp before the trench could be completed. This attack was a success, and Leosthenes, who rushed to the aid of the soldiers during the melee, was hit in the head by a slingshot. He was rushed to his tent and died three days later. After this, the arrival of veterans from Macedon finally lifted the siege. The Greeks burned their camp and retreated. They then went on to fight another battle in Meletea. In this battle, the southern Hellenes were led by Antiphilos, an Athenian with 25,000 infantry and 500 cavalry. They faced down the Macedonian Diadochi Leonatos, who possessed 20,000 infantry and 1,500 cavalry. A contingent of Thessalian cavalrymen, notorious for their equestrian skills and good breed of war horses, were there with Antiphilos, giving the southern Hellenes a slight advantage. After the battle lines had been drawn on both sides, Leonatos ordered his cavalry and phalanx to march forward. The Macedonian phalanx was highly successful against the Athenians due to the effectiveness of their infamous Sarissae spears, but the Thessalians pushed the Macedonian cavalry away, forcing them to retreat up the hills and gain a positional advantage. This was to be Leonatos's end, for he was mortally wounded during the commotion and died. The Thessalians tried to reach them but could not. The next day, Antipater arrived with his own troops and sought to escape from the Greeks. He managed to unite the reinforcements and his own forces at the plain, and then gained the advantage of vantage points to gain control of the landscape and provide cover for all his troops, like Artemis and Apollo shooting at Niobe's children from the sky. He took his army and left, ending the battle. Despite setbacks on land, Athens had a massive fleet it could muster against the Macedonians though it did have issues with a lack of enough personnel to man the entire fleet, and ended up only sending off half of it. The Macedonians had issues with numbers until Kletos the White, one of Alexander's generals, arrived with reinforcements, which shifted the balance of war at sea. Here our sources become jumbled. There is no detailed account of the seaborne war, but we know of at least two battles. What we know is that Kletos achieved victory over the Greek rebels in the Battle of Echinades, and again in another battle on the Cyclades Islands. We know these Macedonian victories caused heavy losses to the Athenian allies, and ended the Thalassocracy of Athens. In August 322 BCE, the Macedonians began their march into the rest of Greece, like Cronos marching to defeat his father Oranos. Reinforcements from Kretoros came to enhance them, and thus, well armed and well supplied, they moved to the south for their vengeful strikes. Athens, Thessaly and the Aetolians rallied their troops and went forward to fight them in what has now become the Battle of Cranon. This is the last battle of the Greek revolt that we know of, and the one that genuinely sealed the fate of Hellas. Antipater and Krateros' forces numbered 40,000 infantry, 5,000 cavalry and 3,000 slingers and archers. The Allied forces included 25,000 infantry and 3,500 cavalry. 
However, the Thessalians were confident in their own horses, which were known for their strength, size and endurance. Antiphilos, the general of the Athenians and the allies, put his cavalry on the right flank. Antipater put his own cavalry opposite them on his left flank. Antiphilos commenced the battle by sending the cavalry forward. The two mounted armies clashed, and after the conflict, the more robust and durable Thessalian cavalry managed to push off the Macedonians. The battle then continued with the infantry sections of the army. The Macedonians continued pressing and slowly pushed off the anti-Macedonian front onto higher ground on the battlefield. The anti-Macedonians managed to push off any further attacks, while the cavalry, seeing that they were now without infantry allies, decided to retreat. The battle continued until the Athenians surrendered. 500 Athenians and allies died, while only 130 Macedonians died. Minon of Pharsalos, the leader of the cavalry, decided that the war was lost, and thus decided to send emissaries for surrender. Antipater was not amused and refused to negotiate. Slowly, the Macedonians took Thessalian cities, and each city surrendered separately. Left without allies, Athens finally surrendered unconditionally. The punishment of the Athenians was great, as they had an oligarchy imposed upon them led by a man named Phocion. Athenian contingents were to leave the Clerukis, her settler colonies, as well as pay massive war reparations. In nearby Munichia, a Macedonian guard was to be established to keep controlling the Athenians, and anti-Macedonian rhetoricians were to be arrested. One of them, the famous Demosthenes, decided to commit suicide rather than be arrested by his enemies. From then on, the politics of Greek city-states would appear and disappear like shades of the dead in the Odyssey. Various Diadochi would make various declarations in places like Corinth linked to defending Hellenic freedom, or promise various factions freedom, control over city-states, or restoration of previous regimes. This is an important thing to consider contextually, it was an attempt to show the Greek city-states that they depended on whichever state of the Diadochi was promising them freedom. The revolt in southern Greece was over. Meanwhile, Cappadocia, which is recorded to have had various small-scale revolts, was subdued by Eumenes. However, the courtly scheming among the Diadochi would only continue. Factionalism slowly grew among the friends and generals of the late great Alexander, as Antigonos, Antipater and Crateros began to see Perdiccas as a man with too much power, which he was wielding for his own gain. In fact, after the death of Leonatos, he was to marry Cleopatra, Alexander's sister, instead. This was orchestrated by an old player in the court, Olympias, Alexander's mother. This was a major offence to Antipater, as his daughter had originally been Perdiccas's intended. With Cleopatra as Perdiccas's wife, any children Perdiccas had would be first in line for the throne, as Heracles and the now-born baby boy Alexander IV were half Persian, and xenophobia meant that they were disadvantaged in the line of succession. Crateros was sent by Antipater into Asia Minor, in an increasingly hostile case of saber-rattling between Antigonos and Perdiccas. Perdiccas found Eumenes, Seleucos, Python and Antigones to be his allies, as they all had proximal satrapies under their command. Then, out of nowhere, a wild card appeared. Ptolemy had arrived in the rich and ancient powerhouse of Egypt, an important location with bountiful grain and a sophisticated state bureaucracy. The wily master of Egypt had likely been scheming for his own independence for a long while. To achieve the legitimacy to do so, he decided to do the unthinkable. Alexander's body was in Babylon until Perdiccas sent it forth to Macedon to be buried. Along the way, and we are unsure as to where this occurred, Ptolemy appeared like the chaos snake Apophis and stole the body. He took it to Egypt, where it remains to this day undiscovered. This was more an excuse for the background scheming, but it did cause the furious Perdiccas to declare war. And thus the first war of the Diadochi began. Hundreds of thousands of soldiers were mustered, as new rulers put Greek and Barbarian side by side to fight for their own ambitions. As the Sarissae were rattled, the gods of all the peoples of the empire assembled to see the impending doom. The Devas, Buddha and Mahavira gathered in India, soon to slip away while Ahura Mazda and his eastern Iranian brethren met in Persia, the heart of it all. In the Near East, the gods of the Arabians in Nabatia gazed upon their Semitic brothers in Babylon, 
while in Egypt, Ra and Osiris gazed upon the Phoenician god Melkart in Tyre from the Nile, and the 1000 gods of Anatolia congregated next to the Olympians and their Thracian and Illyrian divine neighbours. The wars of the Diadochi are about to begin, and like the Iliad, different pantheons will take different sides. These wars will shake the earth to its core. Our series on the Diadochi Wars will continue. To ensure you don't miss it, make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button. Please consider liking, subscribing, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Recently we've started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive content. Consider joining their ranks via the link in the description or button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our private discord and much more. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.